Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the historic expansion of the United States from the original 13 colonies to the conquest of the northern portion of the continent from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Sea and to becoming a global imperial power. We're also going to talk about how Latin America fits into this history. My guest for this conversation is Greg Grandin. He teaches history at Yale University. Greg Grandin also writes for The Nation magazine. And in 2020, he won the Pulitzer Prize in nonfiction for his book, The End of Myth, From the Frontier to the Border Wall in the Mind of America. He's also just republished his book from 2006 that's called Empire's Workshop, Latin America, the United States, and the Making of an Imperial Republic. Greg Grandin, it is a great pleasure to welcome you back to this program, sir. Thanks for having me. It's great talking to you again. And I, we're, we're taking on a big topic, I think, as I laid out in the introduction, and we're probably only in this hour going to be able to scratch the surface at it. But do want to let our listeners know that you're going to be participating in a KPFA-sponsored event tonight with my colleague, and my understanding, good friend of yours, Brian Edwards uh, Tekert, in which we'll have more time to talk about uh, these topics and also take questions from uh, viewers who participate. It's going to be online. It's going to start at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, tonight, and uh, people can find information about this at kpfa.org. All they have to do is look at the uh, events section, and right at the front, there's a picture of you and uh, Brian Edwards Tekert. Uh, the thesis in the book that won the Pulitzer Prize in 2020, The End of Myth, is that through the centuries of westward expansion, the country created this mythology about the frontier to go west, that you can make yourself better, that you can improve your conditions uh, by going west. And of course, that also entails the stealing of land from the native people, it entails the expansion of slavery. But part of your argument, and you'll obviously correct me if I'm off on this at all, is that the election of Donald Trump sort of meant the end of this mythology, in part because there was nowhere else, at least on this continent, at least in, in our portion of, of, of the world, to expand. And in, instead, we sort of turned on ourselves. Now that we're past Donald Trump, at least we think we are, and we have a Joe Biden presidency, how, how does this current moment fit into that narrative and, and does it? And have you had a chance to really even think about it? Well, I have thought about it. I, I, you know, Trump was obviously such a, a signal moment in U.S. history that the book was organized around his election. The argument wasn't so much that he ended the myth or his election ended the myth, but he was more of a symptom of, 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 of the, the loss of the possibility of limitlessness and you know the you know the thing about american exceptionalism you know that phrase is thrown around a lot and and it could mean many different things to many different people but what uh, one of the things that makes the united states unique is the ability to expand you know whether that expansion was in terms of the landed frontier whether that expansion was through militarism whether it was through the opening up of markets and what we might call the, the you know the neoliberalism of the last couple of decades, but just the just the ceaseless ability to think about domestic problems through the lens of growth and expansion, and over the decades, and this the politics of this manifested itself in in different ways, and there were moments of extraction uh, contraction. But but just the, pro the ability of, of presidents to look beyond the frontier and say, that's where our problems will be solved, that, you know, that domestic problems are international problems, that the solution is growth and more growth, that the way that we, you know, confront uh, or deal with uh, 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 social problems is through expansion, that that came to an end. That came to an end, not with Trump, but it came to an end with one endless wars, you know the the catastrophe in Iraq to the the contraction of two thousand and seven two thousand and eight with which ended the growth model and three what made this moment different from other moments of contraction is climate change right we we don't we no longer have the possibility or conceit to think that that um that that public policy could be uh, that could be enacted through the promise and potential of limitless growth and and that's where Donald Trump comes in and and but 
expansion had allowed the U.S. to export its 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 contradictions to you know to you know the the the, the to, to to roll over the trauma from the last war into the next war to um to 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 respond to social demands by by promising more and more growth by growing the pie rather than a redistribution of the pie, and and and. Trump signaled he, he singled an end to that, and, and the metaphor is you know the frontier, which had long been the symbol of American uh, American nationalism, was transplanted by the by the border wall, you know, and the border wall is America's new myth. And to go back to your question about what, whether Biden what what Biden represents, I mean, I think it is too early to tell. I think that he is working within uh, a, a dramatically changed landscape. And in some ways, you can see a flailing that trying to that trying to kind of um, invoke or kind of put into place the the old consensus where where they would invoke foreign policy and and an external enemy in this case China uh, as a way of trying to set, trying to imagine the public good. So the only way we can imagine selling an infra- infrastructure bill, or the only way we can imagine. Um, you know, uh, uh, increasing domestic spending is is by comparing ourselves to China, and I think that that is a, that is a kind of a dangerous game that that Biden is playing. But but it, I also think it might be an exhausted game. We'll see if he's able to do it, and 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 it links back to Latin America because Biden, in many ways, is continuing many of the same policies of Trump, as Trump. That's that's very interesting to think about, and the, the, our, our relations to China right now. When you were outlining that, it it made me think about the 20th century and our relations to the Soviet Union. And in some ways, you could argue some of the social gains that we had uh, in this country were because we had to compare ourselves to another global power. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's many ways in which foreign policy made domestic policy possible. It's just not one template. I think that... um, in some ways, it was pure, tra- purely transactional. That you know, that uh, that uh, some suffragists, uh, suffragettes, uh, um, traded their support for Wilson's entry into World War One for his support of, of of the expansion of the franchise to women. Uh, you know, we could say the same thing with Gomper, Gomperism and, and 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 the AFL, where they traded support for World War One in exchange for some labor reform. Uh, in other ways. I think that um, that expansion uh, changed political culture. It wasn't so tra- so so explicitly transactional, but certainly the invocation of a foreign enemy or foreign threat forced elites to allow some degree of of, of reform of, at home, and 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 without that, um, you know, there really one of the things that that is unique about the United States is that there has been no moment of social progress, no expansion of the promise of liberalism to excluded groups that wasn't correlated to empire in, in, in every way. The, you know, the Jacksonian expansion of the franchise to white, propertyless, illiterate men took place with the, you know, the open, the dispossession of, of Native Americans um, and, and, the, and the opening up of the landed frontier. The, 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 the abolition of the Civil War was also a broken compromise where Lincoln gave uh, Lincoln opened up the West and, and as a way, uh, as a key element of being able to coalesce the power, uh, concentrate the, the, the forces necessarily to, necessary to defeat the South and go back to the progressive movement and the expansion into the Caribbean and the Pacific in the War of 1898. Even the New Deal was, pre- was based to a large degree of opening up foreign markets that allowed the uh, consolidation of a, of a labor-intensive, export-focused, high-tech, capital-intensive industries that supported the New Deal uh, and supported many of the of the of of, of, of uh, FDR's creation of a regulatory state in exchange for foreign markets. Uh, you can go further and think about the, you know, uh, the Great Society in Vietnam. You can think of, as you mentioned, civil rights and the Cold War. Uh, the history of the uh, the history of of liberal progress in the United States is inextricably tied up with expansion, and to break that link is going to take a lot. Is going to take is going to take a serious amount of work because we don't know what it means to articulate a, a domestic common good that isn't that isn't 
riding on the back of the expansion of national power abroad. Sounds like a conundrum. That that <laughs> it is a conundrum. <laughs> do you, do you now? I I want to recognize you said that you think this mythology of the frontier has exhausted itself. But but going back to China, and, and these are unfair questions. We talked to David Harvey a few days ago, and we were talking about the history of neoliberalism. And he said, look, I didn't know to call it neoliberalism until he wrote a book about it in 2005 after he had lived through it, right? So you kind of have to yeah, live right. through the – you're a historian, right? So you, you're looking yeah, yeah. back, not – you know. Wait, though, you write a lot about the present too. Um, but, but does – I mean, obviously we don't – you know, it's not obvious that China – would sort of be like the new frontier, but in this narrative, could it could it be? Well, I don't know if it's so much a frontier, but it's certainly it's certainly an example of the externalization of morality. Where, where as I was mentioning, it's impossible to imagine a positive domestic good that isn't linked to a foreign enemy. So, it all of the public policy pronouncements, which I was trying to sell the infrastructure bill for just one example, or pretty much any bill that Biden is supported forward is linked to competition with China. We have to compete with China. I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's dangerous because it's obviously leveraging. It's, it's obviously, I mean, there's two things going on. One, I think that, that in the Biden administration has, 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 has come to the conclusion that it got, it has to give the foreign policy blob, you know, as that, you know, as it's called a kind of bureaucracy that has a will and force and, and movement of its own, um, what it wants. So, so, so the, so, so the, so the White House can focus on domestic policy. Um, you know, I think that's dangerous. And I also think we're starting to see a, a bit of a, one of those, this, a same kind of bipartisan consensus around China that we saw leading up to the Iraq war. You know, the, 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 you know, this isn't, this is a kind of democratic and Republican demonization of China that, um, that is, that is dangerous. I, you know, this is not to, this is not to, uh, an exculpation of China in any, in any way, but it's a sense that the United States needs desperately to figure out a way to articulate a positive common good that isn't only in relationship to foreign policy or a foreign enemy or, 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 you know, it's, it's got to break this, this deeply embedded tendency within its history to externalize evil and think that think that the, what is preventing the United States from achieving harmony is some kind of foreign obstacle. Greg Grandin, let's, let's dive into history because I wanted to ask you about this. I found fascinating dynamic in your book, The End of Myth, between, and we'll go back to the early 19th century here, the, the 1820s, between two presidents, John Quincy Adams, who's president in the early 1820s, and then Andrew Jackson, who would be president in 1828. Recently, we've talked a lot about Andrew Jackson on the show because we've done shows about John C. Calhoun, who was actually a vice president for both of those guys in a, in a very strange way. Politics were very different then in a way our system worked was very different then. Uh, John C. Calhoun, and and also we talked, we, we did a show recently on uh, the 1830 Indian Removal Act in which Andrew Jackson was very much behind. Uh, a, a running uh, theme in your book, The End of Myth, is sort of this relationship and what John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson represented. Can you, can you tell me about that? Well, I drew, draw the contrast. Uh, John Quincy Adams was, pre was the sixth president of the United States between, um, between 19, I'm sorry, 1824 and 1828. Um, and, and Jackson was the seventh, he was a one-term president Adams and Jackson was, the, was, was, was elected in 1928 and 1828, I can then say in 1928. Um, and there are good contrasts because Adams represented in many ways the last president of the Founders Coalition. That you know, setting aside, and and I don't mean I don't mean this flippantly, but but setting aside issues of of you know, obviously uh, the, the the all of the questions that are concerned that are related to to, to the Founders' re involvement in slavery and and land speculation. They had a. They did. They were of, uh, of of an elite that that did imagine a kind of transcendent national good that wasn't reduced to um, to a, to the 
the bare bones minimal state and 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 the hitching of that minimal state to the to the to the fence of of, of of the institution of slavery and and expansion in the West. Adams Adams was an expansionist. He had a vision. He he especially as a young man, he had a vision of of the United States filling out the continent. He thought it was you know, the manifest destiny. The, that phrase wasn't coined at the time, but he certainly had a full vision of manifest destiny in which white people with their language and their law would 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 spread out from the Atlantic to the Pacific. But he also he also had a vision of, of a, a kind of um, strong federal government that would bring about national improvement. And uh, his he, in a number of speeches as president, he laid out this vision that that really talked about road building and canal building and the expansion of public education. That was a shock for the nascent Jacksonian coalition, the Southerners and 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 the settlers, who um, who saw the federal, who increasingly saw the federal government as a threat. As you know, uh, Jack, Adams, for instance, wanted to use the sale of Western lands to find finance Eastern development. You know, the settlers wanted to use Western lands basically to to, to open up for more settlement. And um, and and the and the rise of Jackson was and and the creation of what became the Jacksonian coalition, which was really what we, when we say the Jacksonian coalition, we're talking about an alliance between Southerners and slavers that held the presidency up to up to, up to the election of, of Abraham Lincoln and set foreign and national policy to a large degree in defense of the institution of slavery. Adams became during this period a bit of a dissident. Um, he, he was elected to to a house seat in Massachusetts, yeah, he, he, and he, he, he increasingly back. began to see expansion as driven by Jacksonianism, as driven by the Jacksons, led by Jackson and, and his allies, as as fundamentally evil. As based, uh, you know, he became he, his his critique of dispossession and war against Mexicans. He began to realize what act, what expansion actually entailed. And so he gave this remarkable speech in 1836 that um, that that uh, that basically set the terms of a that basically described a country that was beginning an endless war. And he, he defined the beginning of that endless war uh, with Andrew Jackson's assault on the creeks within, in, in the, around the time of the War of 1812 against Britain and the destruction of the Creek Nation. And he just foretold blowback. Uh, the expansion of slavery. He thought that we, he had two dreaded fears. One is that the, the United States would split itself apart under, under this drive west, or two, that it would hold itself together, but hold itself together in an iniquitous kind of vile way uh, that would fortify slavery and fortify dispossession. And and so he was against the annexation of Texas. He was against the 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 he was against the Mexican-American War, but his his speech was prophetic in many ways. And in the book, The End of the Myth, I pair it with Martin Luther King's 1967 Beyond Vietnam speech. And I think you could kind of trace out a, a kind of call and response arc between it, between between John Quincy Adams's 1836 uh, condemnation of westward expansion or Jacksonian version of westward expansion and, and Martin Luther King. You know, it was kind of an unbroken arc of endless war. John Quincy Adams, really interesting figure that we haven't talked a lot about on this program. He is the son of John Adams, who is the second president of the United States. The 1824 election is an important election in the sense of, I think in modern stand, modern times, we would actually look at it as uh, it being stolen away from uh, Andrew Jackson, who Jackson, eventually yeah. won in, 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 in 1828. Uh, What's fascinating is, as you mentioned, after his presidency, and, and this seems unusual, but he is elected back back to Congress. And, and he sort of transforms his. It, it, I was almost thinking of Jimmy Carter there when you were describing uh, John Quincy Adams as you had his presidency and then you had his post presidency, which were two very sort of different things. Very different things. I mean, you know, he already as president had invoked the ire of the nascent Jacksonian coalition through his vision of an expansive federal government. 
committed to national improvement. You know, this, you know, he did, but but it really was in his post presidency as a, as a, as a house as a member of the House of Representative that he sharpened his critique. Um, and you know, he he's he, he's obviously a person of contradiction. He was, as I mentioned, an ardent expansionist, but not, but 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 once he saw what 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 it would take to expand. In terms of indigenous possession and 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 constant and endless and endless war against on the on the frontier and against Mexico, he re, he recoiled and he became a very sharp critic. He, you know, he, I mean, he died uh, in 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 eighteen forty eight, a week before the 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 European revolutions of eighteen forty eight broke out. Uh, or maybe on, I think actually, on Feb, maybe uh, I don't hold me to this, but I think around February 18th, I'm not sure, but right around the time that I think perhaps the Paris revolution broke out, but he died right after voting no against a resolution that, that, that wanted to, um, that, that, um, that sought to give, uh, medals to the, the, to heroism in the Mexican American war. He 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 uh, he voted no against it because he was pretty much at this point anti. He didn't he, 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 the militarism that had overcome U.S. civil discourse. He he had recoiled from and uh, and shortly after casting that no vote, he collapsed on the House floor. This is letters and politics, and we are in conversation with Gray Grandin. Gray Grandin teaches history at Yale University. In 2020, he won the Pulitzer Prize and. Nonfiction for his book, The End of Myth, From the Frontier to the Border Wall in the Mind of America. He has just republished another book from 2006 called Empire's Workshop, Latin America, the United States, and the Making of an Imperial Republic. Again, regrettably, we're taking on a big subject and topic this hour, and we're only going to get to scratch at the surface of it. But for folks who want more, Greg Grandin will be participating in a KPFA-sponsored event tonight at 6 p.m., in which he'll be in conversation with my colleague and good friend, and an old friend of yours, as, as, as I understand, uh, Brian. Yeah. Brian. Brian. Ryan Edwards Tekert. Uh, I, I guess his 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 stepfather or uh, was a teacher of yours. His stepfather, Steve London, was a teacher at Brooklyn College in political science. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I should be I, I, I shouldn't be uh, putting out Brian's all, all his inf personal information there, but <laughs> uh, but I have a lot more I could though. I'll I'll, I'll keep it. A, I'll hold him ransom for it. Uh, but that event's going to be tonight at six p.m. Pacific Standard Time. The great thing about, uh, not that the pandemic's great, but the great thing about a KPFA event during the pandemic is everyone can participate. Uh, it's all being done social, uh, socially distanced uh, manner. Uh, it'll be done on the internet. And you can participate regardless of where you are. Uh, just go to kpfa.org and look for the details of the event. You do have to register and, and, and do this a little ahead of time. So go to kpfa.org and you can watch Greg Grandin and Brian Edwards Tekert talk more about these issues uh, tonight. Greg Grandin, as, as I mentioned, you have just republished the book Empire's Workshop, Latin America, the United States, and the Making of an Imperial Republic. Um, this is on the heels, again, of winning the, the Pulitzer Prize for, for your previous book, The, the End of, of Myth. What was it? What was what, I don't know. Did the publisher say, hey, you just won a Pulitzer Prize. Let's republish something quickly. Or or was was this something else? And was there a reason, particularly this book? Is, is this? Yeah, I mean, I had wanted to I had I had wanted to re redo and reorganize Empire's Workshop um, for quite a while. I had originally written it shortly after the invasion of Iraq. When a lot of these Iran Contra hands had had been recycled into the Bush administration, and the initial uh, impetus for it was to try to figure out why, what was the relationship between Iran Contra and and the invasion of Iraq, and 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 the argument at the time developed in in layers, looking at Iran Contra less as a scandal and more as the coming together of the new right coalition. The place that Ronald Reagan gives to movement conservatives, not because it's important, but because it's not important. He, where Reagan is actually quite cautious in other areas of the world, he's able to give Central America to um, to the different constituencies that that 
that powered the new right. And so looking at Iran-Contra as, as the first place that brings together the neocons and the and the religious right and the and the radicalized veterans from Vietnam radicalized to the right um, and and the way liberation theology becomes the first political religion that 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 helps coalesce this movement and forces it to kind of become a become a movement for itself that has an idea of the positive of what they understand as a, as a moral good the remoralization of markets the remoralization of militarism in opposition to liberation theology. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the book, the book was heavily focused on central, the original edition was heavily focused on central America and then made the argument that this coalition comes back together after nine 11, but then goes global. You know, that that's why this Elliot Abrams and John Bolton and, you know, the whole cast of character, even Dick Cheney was involved in Iran Contra. As a congressman, he uh, he was on the he issued a minority report for the in the congressional report that, that basically put forward a theory of press of executive power that that at the time was considered outlandish, but then became you know the essence of the Bush doctrine. The book was organized very. The first edition was organized very tightly around the Iraq War. So each chapter started with some element of the Bush doctrine and then moved back into Central America. Over time, that got confusing to teach because, you know, students, what's the book study? <laughs> who's, who's Elliot Abrams? You know, who's George Bush? So I thought that the argument of the book was merit. If the title alone merited addition that um, merited an addition that wasn't so pegged to a, a moment that it would fade into fade into oblivion. So I so I rewrote it in a way that was more evergreen. Um, and it, and and I and it's and it's expanded. Some of the arguments are expanded, so it's not it's not overwhelmingly about Central America. Um, but it does make the argument that the that Latin America is the. But what I mean by workshop is that Latin America is a place where the United States is. The United States retrenches during moments of crisis to regroup, and 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 so and the, the two main moments that I look you could go back even back to the Jacksonians, you can go back to all of these other political coalitions, but the two main moments are the New Deal and the New Right. So the New Deal during the Great Depression, FDR's administration basically uses Latin America as a way to work out what eventually becomes um, liberal multilateralism, soft power. Uh, the, all the institutions of the United Nations and the regional alliance system that the U.S. after World War II uses to climb to heights of global supremacy were all rooted deeply in the U.S. in the history of the U.S. and Latin America, which I can get to. And then, and then, let me just quickly say, and then after the New Deal coalition unravels in the seventies after Vietnam, the New Right turns back to Central America, to Latin America, but Central America and. And particularly to regroup, and then and then cast out after after that regrouping is done. You're talking you're talking about the Bretton Woods Agreement. This is where we get the uh, the IMF and everything, everything. Now, this uh, is you know, basically for... the United Nations. So Latin so Latin America decolonized in the 1820s, and it came into the world already a League of Nations, already you know uh, uh, you know eight nations that had to deal with each other. This was unprecedented. There was, there was, this had never existed in the world history. Europe was a nation, was a was a was a confederacy of empires, metropoles with colonial states or imperial states or hinterlands. Latin America were, was the emer the, uh, suddenly there was eight republics that had to deal with each other on their own terms. So it it created the institutional and ideological foundations of what became. First, the League of Nations, and then the, and then the United Nations. So it's not just Bretton Woods. It was the so so, and the United States is um, you know the New Deal coalition's willingness to accept many of the demands of Latin America, including especially accepting Latin America's insistence that the U.S. give up the right to intervention and 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 uh, and ex and recognize the formal sovereignty of all nations that was a radical moment in 1933 that the, that the FDR that FDR administration conceded to and rather than leading to a hemorrhaging of US power it actually allowed the US to consolidate its soft power to figure out how to project its power and its 
and, and, and advance its interests without the burden of militarism. And that becomes the model in many ways for what the U.S. does in other regions after World War II. Including Vietnam? No, <laughs> that's that's in the, this, but but certainly CETO and NATO is mo- NATO is modeled on the Rio Pact. Uh, 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 these what, what's these the Rio regional Pact? organizations are ma- modeled on the Organization of American States. Well, what's the so, Rio Pact? The Rio Pact was a mutual defense treaty that 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 Latin, that the United States, the Washington signed with Latin America in World War II. Um, that becomes the model for NATO. Um, uh, the other thing, but, but, and certainly the, the administration of the world in terms of regional organizations allows the U S to circumvent the universalism of the UN. So the United States can tack back and forth and say, could cite treaty obligations with the OAS for why it's not following whatever, you know, whatever resolution is being passed by the UN. So that becomes a, that becomes a very, that allows the United States after World War II to have a bit of agility, but no, Vietnam is, is, you know, obviously there's, there's overreach and there's, and what drives the United States into Vietnam is a whole nother story, but, the, but Vietnam signals the end of the New Deal coalition, you know, eventually the fallout from Vietnam and the rise of the new right. The, the, this New Deal coalition, falls apart during this period of time. What, what do you think is important to understand? What, what do we mean by New Deal coalition and and what what's important? Because oftentimes on this show, I think with its problems, including, you know, embedding uh, Jim Crow policies into the New Deal, it certainly had yeah. problems. Um, but nonetheless, we sort of look back at the New Deal a lot today in a positive light for, for what it did for most regular regular people, um, especially during the Great Depression and leading to, uh, you know, an economic growth that would benefit many people uh, over time. Um, so what do we mean by the, the New Deal uh, uh, coalition and how did it fall? How that coalition fall apart? <laughs> well, that's a great question. And, and, and it's it's there's 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 a long answer and there's the longer answer. <laughs> um when I say the New Deal coalition, I obviously mean the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in in in, uh, in, in, in 1932 and his inauguration in 1933 and his response to the Great Depression. Um, uh, Roosevelt was able to cobble together a coalition of of, of you know uh, labor and the left and liberals, and it had a it had a it had a strong support from 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 as I mentioned labor intensive capital intensive industries that weren't threatened by the expansion of labor rights because they, 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 they were modernizing into pharmaceuticals, uh, in chemicals, you know, the automobile industry. You know, it was the closest thing that the United States had to state capitalism to some degree. And, and there were concessions, as you said, the, the, the racism that was embedded in the New Deal largely had to do with um, the Democratic Party's beholdenness to 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 to, to planters and ranchers and and southerners, and they were uh, they were an element of the of the Democratic Party. So, uh, so one of the things that the Dem- that the New Deal did though was create this language of social rights, you know, which which transcended for a very long time the Jacksonian ideal of a minimal state and individual rights. Roosevelt was particularly adept at being able to sum up the past in in nostalgic ways and then saying very quickly, but those days are gone. You know, now we know we have to move from a state that regulated very little to one that regulates a lot. And yeah, and, and putting forth the conception of social citizenship, the word social was attached, the adjective with social was attached to everything, social security, social rights, social republic, social civilization, you know, social education. The kind of why it fell apart, it fell apart because of the, of the, 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 the attempt to have expansionism abroad, which resulted in militarism, which led to the catastrophe of Vietnam and, 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 and the expansion of social welfare at home became unsustainable and it collapsed. The twin goals of the New Deal, the gradual expansion of liberal developmentalism abroad and, and the expansion of liberal rights at home uh, hit, hit its contradictions in Vietnam at home and, and the limits of civil rights 
abroad. The, the contradictions were also in very much in in the wage labor system. Um, the the, the you could look at the agricultural policy. On the one hand, the New Deal supported the helped restore rural farm communities and small farms. On the other hand, it began to favor large scale agro industry that that in the 1970s overwhelmed those those small farms and those rural communities. So that's a that's that's one example of how it collapsed of its own contradictions. But then also. It, it was organized against the rise of the new right from outside the New Deal, uh, led a frontal assault that that was persistent and increasingly focused. And my argument in Empire's workshop is that Central America in the 1980s is, is, is key to understanding the ascension of the new right. Tell me about that. Tell me about Central America, the 1980s. And I mean, that's yeah. that's a whole hour conversation in and of itself. That's a, that's a whole semester long conversation. Yes. <laughs> you say Latin America, South America by 1979 was locked down under a series of anti-communist dictatorships. The fall of Allende in 73, coups in Bolivia, coups in Brazil, coups in in in, in Bolivia. Uh, uh, in Uruguay, uh, basically turned South America into a garrison state, you know, dominated by the national security doctrine. But Central America was in a boil. The Sandinistas had won in 1979. There were insurgencies in Guatemala and El Salvador, the rise of liberation theology. And, and Carter, as this kind of liminal president, this kind of um, transitional president, responded in contradictory ways. But then Reagan rose to power, promising to take back the third world, um, you know, the Iranian revolution, uh, uh, you know, the, the Sandinista revolution. He, he, got, he, he, he was able to earn quite a good deal of political capital off of the sense that the third world was in revolt and the United States was losing its moral authority. Of course, you know, it was, v of course, Vietnam, you know, the fall of Saigon in 1975. But, um, but, so Reagan, as I mentioned earlier, largely gives Central America to the right. Reagan comes to power promising to restore America's authority in the world. But he largely continues detente in many ways. The Soviet Union still exists. The Soviet Union still has nuclear warheads. So he has to thread carefully in Eastern Europe and in other places of the world where the United States is power was was contested but but central america had no nuclear weapons and you know it was squarely within the united states's backyard it had no absolutely essential resources so we can give it to, so when gene kirkpatrick is his is his ambassador to the united nations a position that he raised to cabinet level called central america in 1982 the most important place in the world today People had a hard time understanding what she meant by that. Well, I mean, how, how could Central America be the most? I mean, there were a lot of things going on in the 1980s, not least the, not least Afghanistan and the, and, the, and the Mujahideen War against Soviet occupation. But I think the Empire's workshop argues is that Central America's importance resided in its unimportance. The fact that Reagan could give the region to movement conservatives and they could live out their fantasies of rolling back communism and putting into place this kind of uh, apocalyptic millennialism when it came to when it came to violence, apocalyptic violence, support of death squads, genocide in Guatemala, the support of the Contra war in Nicaragua. All, that that gift of giving Central America to these different constituencies that make up the new right, you know, everybody from, you know, the, the radicalized Vietnam vets to the right, people like Oliver North and, you know, and and um, and John Seaport and, and people like that, to the neoconservatives like Elliot Abrams and and to the to the out and out old fashioned militarists like John Negroponte to the to the religious right, you know, you know, the, the, the mobilization of fundraising through religious right networks to support the Contras was important element in 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 incorporating the evangelical movement into a into, into state power and um and 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 the fact that liberation theology was so was ascendant and such an ideological threat i mean it's easy to dismiss 
secular socialism, but uh, you know, a, a, a socialist movement that roots itself in 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 divine in the word of God, as and that says that the that the profit motive is 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 is, is, is an agent of greed, and 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 that militarism is a sin. And that imperialism is an inequity, you know, uh, that was a threat that had to be responded to. And so you could look back at, at a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the kind of um, engagement with the world that evangelical intellectuals uh, started to ta- started to that started to uh, um, appear in, in the 1980s was in response and reaction to liberation theology. So the argument is that liberation theology is the first political religion that mobilizes the new right before they move on to political Islam. You mentioned Jean Kirkpatrick, former yeah. U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Very important figure. She She's considered one of the uh, original thinkers when it comes to neoconservatism. Not so much. Yes, yes, she was a conservative thinker. I think she would have departed with conservatism. Actually, after the Cold War, she was she was against going into the Gulf War and for, first Gulf War. She, I mean, she has a famous quote. I think it doesn't matter who pumps the gas. You know, the United States has to, you know, nation build at home. She thought the Cold War was an opportunity to turn back inwards. So I don't know if I would call her a neoconservative. She was. She was a. She was a militarist. And she she was and she was a Democrat, a conservative Cold War Democrat that that um, that that was key in this rise of the new rights response to loss in Vietnam. To, you know, she uh, much of her writing was dedicated to criticizing the crisis of confidence that had overcome the Democratic Party. You know, she blamed the Democratic Party's sense of of of. Um, you know, of the, the confusion that Vietnam elicited within the, of course, the Democratic, the Vietnam was a Democratic Party war, right? From Kennedy to, to LBJ, um, from Truman to Kennedy to LBJ. But, um, but, but loss in Vietnam and the criticism and, and it created this set, this crisis of confidence within the upper echelons of the Democratic Party that mistook friends for enemies and enemies for friends. And so Jean Kirkpatrick was key in, in, in countering that, that crisis of confidence and insisting that the United States needs to act in the world and act with confidence that when it does act, it's acting for a moral good, even when it's supporting dictators. You know, she, she, she famously created that typology between dictators and totalitarianism. I mean, she was drawing on old Cold War social science going back to Hannah Arendt that, uh, that understood totalitarian communist regimes as having no internal possibility of reform. Whereas authoritarians like Somoza or like the Shah or like sort of, you know, had the possibility of civil, allowed a kind of autonomous realm of civil society that could be democratized with from within. But the Sandinistas, because they were Marxists, were on a, constantly had to mobilize and were a constant threat. It's a ridiculous typology that doesn't correspond to reality, but it, it did frame the policy debate. So Kirkpatrick was indispensable. Yeah. this reorientation. I, I don't want to get stuck on this issue because we're almost out of time and I have one final question <laughs> for you. Uh, but but could we say that Kirkpatrick then was influential on what would become an, a neoconservative movement, even though she wasn't yeah. a neocon herself? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she had she she took her own particular route and, and you know, and, 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 and that division you know, coming out of the Cold War, where she she opposed the first Gulf War, but Kissinger was in favor of it. You know, that was that was that that was a kind of key division within the within the militarist the re, the restoration of militarism um, in terms of foreign policy. But yeah, Kirkpatrick, you could certainly see many of the assumptions of neoconservatism in, in Kirkpatrick's defense of, of, of U.S. policy in Central America, except that she was against nation building. See, this is the thing. She was more vicious than the neocon. In Central, and she, her argument about El Salvador is that you, the U.S. should give up any notion of reform or winning hearts and minds. She was, she was an, she, she, you know, she, she represented a tendency that goes back to, you know, the war against Native Americans, that what you have to do is actually just win the war first and then reform. 
And so she, she, she in some ways, yes, she was obviously very influential on neocons, but departed from them in, in, in important ways. So we have the disastrous war in Afghanistan, Iraq, and largely war on terrorism. Uh, some of us saw that coming, uh, though, you know, it, it, anyways. Anybody with eyes to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there was a time where not lot did not have the, the eyes to see it. There, there was a yeah. short window of time when this was all beginning. Um, and I know you were one of those people who did see it. Um, but was Trumpism a rejection of that new right coalition? That sort of yes and no. Over from... <laughs> yes and no. He is a rejection in the sense that he does represent an acknowledgement that there are that there, that that it, it's a rejection of the idea that um, that that all boats could be lifted up. That all we have that what we have to, all we have to do is, is is create a market, a global market society with international rules, and and all boats will be lifted. All nations could sit at the table. Trump is a realization that 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 was a fantasy. I mean, it was a fantasy at the time. The U.S. consumes vast amounts of resources and produces a vast amount of the world's uh, waste. Um, and and uh, but but um, but Trump is an acknowledgement that that there are limits. That you know the frontier has ended. That that not all boats will lift. That not everybody can sit at the table. And we have to have borders and enforce those borders along racial lines. It's not. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's necessarily a disenchantment and a, and a higher form of realism, although there's a, there's a tendency to kind of, especially in the early years of Trump, to say that oh, Trump is just a is just is a, is is a, is a, is a more realistic assessment of how of the the brutality of the world. He um, he represents a different form of enchantment. He he says that basically the United States can do what it's continue to live as it's been living. All it has to do is is build a wall, and then and then and then we can go back to this idealist freedom as freedom from restraint, um, which is deeply embedded in, in in U.S. history. I think Trump is the first climate change president. I think Naomi Klein might have said this, and I and one of the things that she said is that there's the, the, which I which I love repeating is that um the only thing scarier than than a nativist movement that denies climate change is a nativist movement that that accepts the reality of climate change because their policy solution isn't the Green New Deal their policy solution is 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 brutal and tribalist and and and, uh, and inhumane. Greg Randon has been our guest again. He teaches history at Yale University. He won the Pulitzer Prize for in 2020 for his book, The End of Myth, From the Frontier to the Border Wall in the Mind of America. He's also republished a book from 2006. It's also been reworked. It's just not a republishing, but he have a new yeah. introduction and reworked it to make it more uh, contemporary called Empire's Workshop, Latin America, the United States, and Making of an Imperial Republic. Greg Grandin will be participating in a KPFA-sponsored event tonight starting at 6 p.m. that you can join Online, you just go to kpfa.org. You do have to, to, to get tickets for it, so you, you do have to register uh, ahead of time. But if you go to kpfa.org, you will see uh, an events section. And right there at the very top is a photo of Gray Grandin, and uh, who he'll be in conversation with tonight, Brian Edwards Tekert, my colleague and friend, and, and your friend too. Gray Grandin, uh, it was great to spend this hour with you. Thank you for taking this time. Thanks, Mitch. It's always wonderful to talk with you.